Welcome to Why Not Change the World, the RPI podcast. I'm your host, Jeannie Hedden Gallagher. In this episode, we're doing a deep dive into a project aimed at making more effective masks, something we desperately need in this pandemic era and beyond. Two researchers at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute who are collaborating on this effort spoke to my colleague, Tori Wells. She'll take it from here. Let's start with Professor Helen Za. She's an assistant professor of chemical and biological engineering at Rensselaer. I want to start by just filling listeners in on what you're working on. It's a way to allow N95 masks, which have been obviously so critical during this pandemic, to be reused. Could you start just by explaining your approach? What's your idea here? So the original motivation for this project is the shortage of N95 masks that healthcare workers were facing. Uh, when the the pandemic began. And one of the problems underlying the reason why the shortage was occurring is because these masks, which are designed to protect individuals that work regularly with uh, patients who have been diagnosed with a disease like COVID-19, to have protection against aerosol transmission of the disease. So COVID-19 is uh, a respiratory illness, which means that people are often coughing out aerosol droplets, or even when they speak or yell or sneeze or cough, you have all of these aerosol droplets that contain the virus going into the air. And you can imagine the frontline health workers that deal you know, on an hourly, minute basis with patients that have this disease are at a high risk for transmission. And so these N95 masks are, are they're actually not just face masks, they're technically classified as respirators. They actually are rated to block uh, at least 95% of these aerosol particles um, and protect the user who's wearing them. So part of the problem is because of the way they are designed and the way they are, the technology works, they are designed to be a one-time use disposable technology. So the idea is the doctor or a nurse, before they go in to talk to a patient, puts one on. As they're speaking to the patient, they assume that you know the the outside of the mask is being contaminated by aerosol droplets, which are so small that you know you can't even see them by visible eye. But they assume that the mask is being contaminated by them, and then after they leave the patient's room, they really should just take that mask off, drop it directly into the biohazard waste bin, and put on a fresh one before going to see the next patient. Otherwise, you risk sort of cross contaminating, um, you know, patient A to patient B. And so that means that um, because this mask is designed for single use only, it cannot be um, effectively disinfected. It has no ability to disinfect itself. It really should be one-time use, not reusable, uh, not washable. And that means, you know, you go through a lot of them. And so the idea behind the project is to endow these masks with something on their surface that actively kill viruses that come in contact with it rather than just acting as sort of a physical barrier for the virus to get through the mask. So in this project where we're trying to create these antiviral coatings that will modify the surface of the masks, we are looking at a couple of different avenues actually. Uh, One of these avenues is to use polymers, molecules, chemicals that are already available commercially. Maybe they've just never been utilized in this particular application before but they're commercially available for another application. We also have work that is looking at making completely new uh, molecules that have specific antiviral activity against the virus that is caused that is causing COVID-19 um, and also perhaps can form, you know, exceptionally good coatings with the idea that, you know, this may be a, a, maybe a longer term technological solution or, I mean, I'm not going to lie, probably this is not going to be the last, you know, pandemic that strikes our society. And so in the long term, we're also looking at completely new technologies that may help. I want to ask you about where the idea came from. I'm really curious about that. And I think some of the listeners may be too. Did you start brainstorming when the pandemic happened? Or was this an idea you had already been working on? So the idea actually, this was not a project that we were working on before the pandemic started. And the idea actually came about because I was talking to a friend of mine who is a doctor in Florida, and her husband is actually also a nurse. 
And I was asking them, you know, what is one of the biggest challenges here? Like, why why is there such a shortage? Um, and you know, we saw all over the news that the the N95 mask shortage was causing um, you know people to buy them off the black market, pay these exorbitant prices. And I was asking her, what, what's actually the problem that's causing this? And she was describing to me the workflow, you know, of of how these masks are used. That you're supposed to put them on when you see one patient, and then take them off immediately after, and put a new one on. That they're supposed to be one time use disposable. And when we actually started looking into the technology of why that is, why we can't wash them and disinfect them so easily, it became obvious that this is actually a big technological challenge. And so that was sort of the original motivation or the the, the impetus for the project. Though the my background is on making um, you know functional coatings. So our approach, which is to make coatings of antiviral materials on the fiber filters of these masks, is sort of in line with my expertise. And alongside that, my um, collaborator, uh, Professor Ed Palermo, has uh, years and years of research expertise in creating polymeric materials that are antibacterial, and these materials can also have similar um, inhibitory effects on viruses. And so we already had the expertise there, but the idea for the project really came from an actual need in the field, which uh, we learned about after talking to actual frontline healthcare workers that are facing the problem on a daily basis. That was a really important conversation. Can you talk about some of the challenges associated with this research? Right. So there's some very interesting technological challenges with uh, the problem. And and so one of the things that I think uh, is not fully appreciated uh, by the public, because you know these masks, they, they look like they're just uh, plastic or fabric, they're, they're throwaway, but there's actually a lot of technology behind the filter that goes into these masks. They are able to trap exceptionally small particles, you know, particles that are in the scale of hundreds of nanometers or smaller in size, which wow. is... About ten, that's a thousand times smaller than the thickness of your hair. They're able to trap these particles, more than 95% of these particles, and they're able to do so without making it extremely cumbersome for someone to breathe through the filter for extended periods of time. Now, if, you know, if you've ever worn one of these, you know that breathing is not the simplest thing. I mean, it's, it doesn't feel like you're wearing nothing, but you can still breathe. You can still work sort of a bit vigorously, and it's okay. And actually, to get that to happen where you have good breathability but still exceptionally good barriers against very small particles is technologically um, you know, something that's been developed over the years. And what that involves is a surface. So if you actually zoom in using a microscope into these the filters in these N95 masks, you see they're made up of a bunch of really, really small fibers that are a micrometer or smaller in size. And these fibers actually have on their surfaces uh, a negative charge that is it's technically called an electric, uh, electric charge and is put there on purpose to help the fibers be able to essentially trap these particles that it's trying to prevent from coming through the mask. And without that charge, the ability of the filter to block particles will not be as good, which means they have to be a higher density of fibers, which means breathing is more difficult. Okay. And so... The filter technology has been developed in a particular way to give you good breathability, but still good barrier properties. And actually, one of the reasons why these masks can't just be washed uh, or dipped in, you know, isopropanol or a hand sanitizer or bleach, why they can't just be washed with soap is because all of those processes will disrupt that charge on the fiber surface, which is giving it a lot of its um, ability to trap particles. And so one of the challenges is, how do we modify the surface to give it antiviral activity while maintaining the similar ability to trap particles? So there's a lot of testing that needs to be done because we can't just assume that whatever modifications we make are going to not affect things like breathability, um, filtration efficiency, and um, you know we can't just assume that because any small change, you know, even if you can't see it visually. Uh, could be on the molecular length scale, so nanometer or even sub-nanometer length scale, those changes might actually impact the, you know, either the breathability or the ability for the mass to filter particles. And we don't want that. We want to maintain all of those properties of the filter, with it, but it give it additional antiviral properties. And so 
it does require, you know, a variety of testing. For example, we need to do tests to see if viruses are actually killed by the material. But we also need to do breathability tests. So there's, you know, and, and I don't just mean put it on a person and see if they can breathe. I mean quantitative tests to see what kind of airflow we're getting through the mask. How well does that compare to, you know, off-the-shelf masks that anybody would buy and wear? We also need to do official tests uh, for filtration efficiency. So N95 masks are actually officially tested uh, and certified according to NIOSH standards. There's very specific requirements for how those tests must be carried out. There's very specific flow rates for the airflow through them. There's very specific sizes of particles you have to use for the test. And so we need to do those tests as well to make sure that whatever we're doing to the mask, we're only giving it the additional ability to kill viruses. We're not harming its ability to, um, you know, to provide filtration. So it is technically challenging. Uh, it's not just a matter of, you know, tossing something on, onto the mass and saying, there, there you go, <laughs> it's done. Right. Now, obviously, all of your work is challenging. All of it has critical applications. But I imagine the urgency of this research feels a bit different. Definitely. We are funded by a, a National Science Foundation grant under, it's, it's officially called a RAPID grant, and that means it's recognized that this is to address an urgent problem that is immediately uh, affecting society. And so not only is, I mean, the project it designed, we've designed it in such a way that we, we have avenues, you know, for example, where we're using off-the-shelf chemicals um, and really, really simple uh, methods in hopes that we can really cut down the, the amount of time it will take to develop this technology. Um, but we're also doing that in sort of keeping in the back of our minds that this is a technology that we want to be able to be applied by people, you know, by consumers out in the field, as, if you will, to their own stock of masks, rather than having to, you know, go buy something that went through a, a completely new manufacturing line. We really wanted to target something like a, a process for giving these masks antiviral capabilities that can be applied by the end user. So let's say the hospital has their own stock of masks that, you know, they already bought. Um, they can apply our process using off-the-shelf chemicals, and, you know, we, and we hope that that means an immediate addressing of the problem rather than developing something, getting it patented, and then you know, developing new manufacturing lines and then distributing it. Uh, we're going for sort of a decentralized open access type solution. Uh, and a lot of that is because of the urgency of, of this problem, as well as the, the globalness of the problem. Right. This is something that could be applied across the world. Right. Not only does this research pose some really interesting and complex challenges, but it's also leaning on interdisciplinary expertise to develop solutions. I now want to introduce you to Professor Ed Palermo. He's an assistant professor of material science and engineering at Rensselaer, and he's working with Professor Zah on this research effort. Let's start with your area of expertise. It's, at least in part, in antimicrobial polymers. Can you start by explaining what that means? Right. Yeah. So my my PhD was in polymer synthesis and particularly for um, antibacterial applications, which is a closely related field to antivirals. And, and that's what we've been studying uh, most recently. Can you talk a little bit about the other applications for your research? Sure. So um, antimicrobial materials in general, meaning they can kill a broad spectrum of bacteria or viruses, um, they're pretty broadly applied um, as disinfectants, as surface coating. So, um, for example, if you had a door handle or keyboard or something that was going to be a high-touch surface, you might use a coating of antimicrobial polymer on the surface so that you don't need to continuously spray disinfectant on it, that the, the surface itself um, sort of automatically kills microbes upon contact with that surface. Um, and so you could think of a, a very broad range of, of practical applications for that sort of technology. So in terms of this project, how may an antimicrobial polymer be helpful in enabling the reuse of critical masks? Right, so the mask material 
if it can be coated with a very thin layer, and it has to be thin because you don't want to clog the pores, um, you know, the little openings in between the fibers of the mask. So you need right. a really thin coating of this stuff on those fibers that the mask is made out of. If you do that, then the mask is going to be inherently self-sterilizing. So if aerosol droplets come into the contact with these fibers, the virus will be deactivated. So the outer envelope will be disrupted to the point where it's now essentially deactivated, or you can think of it as dead virus on the surface of the material. So um, we think that will enable more prolonged use of N95s when they're in short supply. Let's go back to the beginning of the pandemic. Can you talk about how this research partnership with Professor Za came to be? And why do you think this interdisciplinary approach is so critical to solving a challenge like this one? Basically, since the beginning of the shutdown, a very large number of faculty, uh, staff, and, and technicians and lab managers at RPI were meeting very regularly um, through video conferencing to come up with, you know, to put our heads together and just think of what can we do. And so one thing that came out was, you know, if we have expertise in antimicrobial materials, can we use that in conjunction with PPE, which uh, here the interdisciplinary part comes in because I know how to make a polymer that kills bacteria really well and is generally non-toxic to human cells, but I didn't know how I would coat the mask because it's a porous fibrous material. And so if I just put a coating that I would normally make on it, it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be breathable anymore. So Helen Za knows a lot about making really thin coatings on the surfaces of materials. That's one of her, her chief areas of expertise. And so we just sort of stumbled upon this idea that if we combine um, her coating approach with some of the polymer chemistry that, that I have in my wheelhouse, we could potentially make these, you know, auto self-sterilizing uh, fibrous materials focused at the moment on the N95 uh, face piece respirator, but um, probably generalizable to your fabric mask or even the, the disposable surgical ones. It seems this could be useful even beyond this pandemic. I hope so. Um, you know, there are still a lot of technical challenges that we need to work out, but if this is fully successful, I could imagine even people who are only going to use a mask once in times when they're abundant, um, it may provide some additional protection uh, in terms of the healthcare workers. So I, I do think there, there's going to be a lot of opportunity beyond uh, the time of COVID. What do you find most interesting or challenging about this research effort? Or maybe it's one and the same. So to me right now, uh, I've made the molecules, a bunch of different um, antimicrobial polymer molecules that, that we're working with. And to me, uh, that, that sort of thing is already pretty well established in my lab. So that's not the most uh, intellectually exciting. It's just, okay, we, we need some stuff, so I'll, I'll make it. Um, what turns out to be really interesting is the way you do the coding procedure has a really big impact on how much or how dense of a coating you can get on the fiber. So again, you want it to be really thin, um, just a few nanometers, maybe tens of nanometers um, on the fiber. But paradoxically, you want to get as much of the stuff as you can on there. So you need a really thin coating, but it has to be very dense. And so the, the procedure is solvent-based. So it's, it, the polymer has to be dissolved in a solvent, mm, preferably water being the solvent, and so you need to really play with the properties of the material so that it can be dissolved in water, but it doesn't really like to be in water, that it would prefer to stick a little bit on the surface of, in this case, the fiber is polypropylene, so a hydrophobic plastic-like material. Um, so that kind of very careful interplay between solubility and, and film forming characteristics has been uh, a fun challenge to work on. Mm. Where we're at right now um, is that we have coatings made and we're characterizing them by microscopy and other spectroscopic techniques. We have an assay developed to test their efficacy against model coronaviruses, first of all. Mm. Um, and then when we find a material that works the best in terms of breathability, killing virus, um, 
and, and you know all the all the characteristics that are desirable of it then we'll be sending some sample materials to Mount Sinai where they're going to test it against actual clinical isolates of the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, that were collected during the height of the, the pandemic in New York. I would think um, within the next several months, we should have a prototype that's proven uh, to do what we think it should. And then from there, um, who knows where it'll go. I pose this question to Professor Zah as well, but I'd like to ask you too. All of your work is important. All of it has critical applications, but I imagine the urgency of this particular research project feels a bit different. Yeah, it does. I mean, it. it um, we always say that our research can have practical applications, and it often does, but it's rare to be, you know, this close to something that's really affecting a very large number of people, you know, in an unprecedented way. So I, I would say it feels a bit surreal. Um, <laughs> I've always, I've always considered myself an applied researcher, but now it's, you know, very applied. This episode of Why Not Change the World was recorded remotely due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Please take a moment to rate the podcast on whatever app you're on. And if you'd like to learn more about what's happening at Rensselaer, visit rpi.edu. Thanks for listening.